So we are here at the Yorktown Battlefield in Yorktown, Virginia, and uh, it's good to be back. I came as a little kid. Unfortunately, I don't remember much from that trip. So today we're going to explore the Yorktown Battlefield and uh, help shed some light on this important battle that ultimately would secure America's independence. Now obviously, a lot of events would transpire that would lead to this Battle of Yorktown. So I'm going to give you like a surface level view of this battle. Um, if you want to learn more about it, the American Battlefield Trust and the Smithsonian are by far the best resources to go to and do some research on your own time. Um, to give you a quick synopsis, the British would eventually shift their focus from the northern colonies to the southern colonies to try and take advantage of a large loyalist population. Now despite some early success in the southern campaign, the British weren't really able to achieve a lot of their goals. The Americans controlled a lot of the countryside, and as the campaign progressed, the British supply lines became long and drawn out. And after a few early victories, they would suffer a few defeats at the Battle of the Cowpens and Kings Mountain. Now Cornwallis would grab another victory at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, but this would be a costly victory, and he would pull back his forces to Virginia to refit and regroup. Now once Cornwallis pulled back to Virginia, he would set up camp first in Petersburg. But then after some confusing deliberation with Clinton, uh, he would eventually pull his forces to Yorktown, uh, which was a deep water port, which in theory would allow Cornwallis to not only be resupplied from the sea, but he could have access to reinforcements. Well, unfortunately, the Virginia Peninsula is a long narrow strip of land surrounded by water, so it would be easily cut off, but I'm not sure if Cornwallis knew that at the time. Now we're going to start our journey here today where George Washington would set up his headquarters. Now they have his actual tent at the visitor center here. So if you're needing a uh, good visual representation of what his headquarters would have looked like, if you go to the visitor center, you're gonna see exactly what it looked like. That was by far one of the coolest pieces I've ever seen. So here we're approaching the area where General George Washington would set up his headquarters. How cool is that? So this uh, description is saying that he would have two tents set up. One would be for his headquarters and one would be for dining. And this illustration here before us is Washington and his staff planning the assaults on redoubts number nine and number 10. Wow. George Washington is one of my favorite figures in history, so being able to walk on the same ground as he did is uh, a really cool experience. But this would be the area that Washington, Rochambeau, Lafayette, Hamilton, and a few other figures you may have heard of uh, deliberated and planned the uh, siege of Yorktown. So we're here at a small memorial and cemetery, and I wanted to stop and share this with you. So the combined American and French forces lost around 400 casualties here during the siege of Yorktown, two thirds of which were French. So right here before us lies 50 unidentified French soldiers that were killed during the siege of Yorktown here. So I wanted to stop by and pay my respects because without France's help, the American Revolution may not have ended the way we wanted it to. And the sign here stating 50 unidentified French soldiers killed in action during the siege of Yorktown here. So we're approaching the French encampment and this part of the battlefield is called French Artillery Park. Now this is an area where they would assemble their artillery pieces, get them ready for battle, do inventory, and uh, fix any damaged pieces that were uh, in need of repairs. But you can kind of see by the illustration how they're all lined up and ready to stage. So you would have your artillery piece, and this piece behind it would be your caisson, and that's where the ammunition, or powder, and other things like that would be. And 
they have a few pieces here so of course we have to get up close and personal and here is one of the field guns that would be used in the siege of Yorktown now there are a few different pieces so this one uh, maybe it's called a field gun, but uh, you would also have howitzers, which their barrel would be slightly shorter, and you would have mortars. And they would all have different trajectories, and they would all have a different end goal. But these, by far, would have the longest range. I believe around 1,000 to 1,200 yards. So we're just down the road from Washington's headquarters, and a name that you might be familiar with, Baron von Steuben, who was instrumental in the American Army's success after Valley Forge. Well... Him and his units, excuse my rental car, were camped in this field. Now there was also a French hospital on the other side of this field here, but there were several units from Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland all camped in this field. And this location is, now you gotta bear with me because I don't speak French. This is Barbenois Brigade Encampment. Now the French army here in Yorktown was broken up into three brigades. Now this brigade that was encamped here would be 1800 strong and it would be uh, comprised of the De Point Regiment which was brought from New York by Rochambeau. So we're making our way through the Yorktown battlefield near Washington's headquarters and came across this artillery piece and just started thinking about the thousands of American, French, Marquis de Lafayette, Rochambeau, Von Steuben, all camping in these fields and woods. It's uh, a pretty cool feeling to be walking in the footsteps of people that you read so much about. Now, when Cornwallis would set up camp here in Yorktown, the bulk of Washington's army was in New York. Now, Washington was with General Rochambeau, and Washington was dead set on taking back New York. Luckily, Rochambeau was able to convince him to beat up with Lafayette and the rest of the Continental Army here in Yorktown. Now, Rochambeau would also direct de Grasse's fleet from the Caribbean to sail up into the Chesapeake and blockade Cornwallis. So the trap is beginning to be sprung. So we've seen the encampments of both the American and French forces, but what about the battlefield itself? Well, we are coming up on the first line that would be constructed by American and French soldiers. So right here before us is the first siege line that would be constructed by American and French forces. On the night of October 6th, 1500 French and American soldiers began constructing the first siege line here. And this siege line would run for about a half mile around the city of Yorktown. Now in case of a British assault, an additional 2,500 soldiers would be stationed outside these outer works here, protecting the crews as they worked. And uh, this is just a small portion of the first siege line. Now this location here is the Grand French Battery. So you have your outer works here, you have your gun emplacements and this structure here is your powder magazine now something to point out these uh platforms here this is where the cannons would rest now on the night of october 6th it was raining but when you were constructing a siege line or any sort of fortification you'd want your cannons sitting on a solid piece of ground here so they would construct these platforms and then the cannons would go on top of it and uh, it would prevent the cannon from sinking into the soft earth just to give you a little perspective, here is the Grand French Line, and it's going to be hard for you to see, but right here, near this clump of trees here, that's the British defensive line, and you can see this structure here, that is the Yorktown National Cemetery. I believe this position is about 800 yards from the British defensive works, so well in range of the French and American cannons. So here they have a few examples of some of the pieces that would have been in the American and French arsenal. This one closest to us here, that's your standard field gun. 
that's going to have the longest range. Now the one next to it has a shorter barrel that's a little fatter. That's a howitzer. That trajectory would have been a little higher and sometimes the shell would even bounce when fired at fortifications. It would kind of skip across the ground. And that piece on the far side right here, that is a mortar. Now that mortar will essentially fire shells straight up into the air and in theory those shells would come down on top of the earthworks or behind them inflicting damage on the uh, defenders. And I just wanted to give you a closer look at the mortar here. Jeez, I would not want to be on the receiving end of one of these. And you can kind of see how it would traverse on this platform here. Again, the uh, trajectory of that shell, it would fire and go straight up into the air. And then in theory, it would come down behind the fortifications or on top of the fortifications. But yeah, here is your siege mortar. And here's a better example. So your field gun has a lower trajectory. And here's your mortar. And your howitzer. You can kind of see, this is always pretty interesting. It can kind of skip across the field there. And just to give you layout of the land here, this is where we are. We're at the Grand French Battery. And you have readouts nine and 10 just before us. And like I said, this outer defensive work would stretch a half mile and the Americans would be on our right or the British left. Now again, we talked about George Washington's uh, symbolism. He would drive the first pick to commence the construction of these fortifications. Now he would also fire the first cannon on the American side. And legend has it, once that cannon was fired, that cannonball bounced around in the town of Yorktown, striking several buildings and uh, entering a building housing British officers. And another legend has it, a British officer took that cannonball right to the chest. Don't know if any of that is true. With George Washington, it always seems to be a pretty interesting story. Now the first siege line in the Grand French Battery is just on the other side of that brick fence. And here we are at the second siege line, which would bring the French and American forces about 400 yards closer to the British lines. Now, the total distance from the second siege line to the British defenses was about 300 and 350 yards. There's my wife, hello. Now, on the night of October 11th, Washington would order the siege line to be constructed. And on the morning of October 12th, the second siege line, at least this portion, would be completed. There was just one issue. This siege line, couldn't be extended to the York River because the British had outer defenses and they had redoubts number nine and number 10 on the American right or the British left. So we are now making our way into the second siege line here and to give you some reference. Again, they couldn't extend their line because of the British redoubts. Making our way through the inner works here. Gosh, this is cool. So again, I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but if you're here, this is obviously the second siege line. And right here, near this clump of trees, that is the British inner works. I believe that's the horn work, which was a British stronghold along their inner works. But you can just see how close these lines are now. And you gotta think how demoralizing it would have been to go to bed on the night of October 11th and to wake up and your enemy is 400 yards closer and almost within musket range. So we're making our way along the second siege line here. And again, you have your magazine off the outer wall here. You don't want that taking a direct hit from the enemy guns. And here's a few more gun platforms and gun emplacements. Gosh, I mean, how could you not love history? We're literally walking on the same ground that we won our independence on. Just amazing. Something that's always interesting to me as well is just under 100 years later, the American Civil War would sweep through this very same territory. So we mentioned the second siege line would bring the allied forces 
400 yards closer to the British works just over this field here. But there was one problem. The British had two strong points on their left or our right. Those were redoubts number nine and number 10. So until those positions were taken, you could not extend the second siege line all the way to the river. And it's probably a very uncomfortable feeling having your second siege line here with your enemy directly on your flank. So on October 14th, Washington and his staff would come up with a plan to deal with those redoubts. And uh, that's where we're headed now. So it may be hard to see, but just through these trees is the York River. And here would be readout number 10, and here would be readout number 9. And in order for the Allied forces to continue their second siege line to the river, these two strong points had to be taken. And we're approaching readout number 10. And under the cover of darkness, a man by the name of Alexander Hamilton and about 400 Americans would advance across this very field with their muskets unloaded because they didn't want to risk a stray shot, bayonets fixed, and they would approach readout number 10, and which is just right there. Now this is not the original readout, it was reconstructed because as you can see, time and erosion is taking its toll on this battlefield. But this is the exact location where they found remnants from readout number 10. And Alexander Hamilton, and his 400 Americans would storm this redoubt through the abatis work and the phrasing and advance up the parapet and take the redoubt within minutes. Obviously these trees would not be here, this would be field. So you would have your Americans advancing across the field and the majority would attack this side and you would have another 80 Americans perform a flanking maneuver and attack the rear of redoubt number 10. Now the original plan would call for the Americans to halt in what would be a field right here. And they would wait for engineers, or at the time they called them pioneers. And they would come up to the British works and cut through the abatis, which would be a colonial version of barbed wire. It would be intertwined sticks, branches, logs, and things like that. And they would cut past through the abatis, and they would hopefully take out some of these phrasings here, which are these guys here. But the Americans didn't wait. In true American fashion, they just stormed the uh, readout here and uh, captured the readout within minutes. And this is the corner where readout number 10 would be. This is amazing. And look down here. I don't know if you can see this plaque here. On this line, on the Siege of Yorktown on October 14th, 1781, at night, the battalions of Alexander Hamilton and Lawrence of the Light Infantry Division of Major General Marquis de Lafayette, with unloaded muskets and fixed bayonets, scaled these parapets and gallantly captured the redoubt number 10, which formed the extreme left of the outlying British defenses. So we're approaching the rear of redoubt number 10. And again, you would have a flanking force of about 80 Americans, and they would attack the rear of the fort. Now, as the Americans were assaulting redoubt number 10, 400 French under the command of Colonel Dupont would be storming redoubt number 9. Now, the main difference between redoubt number 9 and redoubt number 10 was redoubt number 9 was a little bit heavier fortified, and the element of surprise was lost as the French paused in this field to allow the, those engineers that we talked about to come up to the readout here to break through that abatis and the phrasing, uh, the British opened up on the French and the French would suffer a significant amount of casualties. Now once several gaps were opened up in the outer defenses here at readout number nine, the French would storm readout number nine and after some hand-to-hand -hand combat, readout number nine would fall and with both redoubts falling to the American and French forces, that allowed the construction of the second siege line here. And that is right here. So keep in mind, this redoubt here would be essentially in an open field. And this isn't part of the British defense network. This is the second siege line that would be constructed 
after the redoubts were in the American and French hands. So if there's a little confusion, I know sometimes battlefields can be confusing. Hopefully this offers some sort of clarification. And off in the distance there is the Yorktown Visitor Center. And around the Visitor Center is your British defensive line. So you can see by completing this line all the way around to the York River, uh, Cornwallis and the British Army, their days were numbered and they knew it. Showing you some of the guns here on the second siege line. Again, I'm not an artillery expert, but I wanna say these are 18 pound naval guns. Usually naval guns have these uh, wooden carriages here because it offered a little more room on the uh, ships there. And the field works had those bigger wheels. But I wanna say these are 18 pound siege guns, which uh, pack a punch. Something that's also interesting as I stand atop of readout number nine is some of these were recreated and restored, but a lot of these are the earthworks from the Civil War. Um, during 1862, the Peninsula Campaign would sweep through this area and another siege would take place here. So many of these earthworks were from the American Civil War built on top of the American and British lines from the American Revolution. Now, I thought this was very neat in commemoration of the French soldiers and sailors who gave their lives for American freedom. This memorial erected near the site of Redoubt Number 9 and the second parallel of the trenches of Yorktown. Captured 14 October 1781. That's really cool. And you can see a lot of people have paid their respects here. So before we wrap up here today, I did want to show you the British perspective here at Yorktown. So we are at the Yorktown Battlefield Visitor Center and around the Visitor Center is the British Defense Network. And right here before us is considered the strongest part of the British defenses here. And this is the Hornwork. Again, most of these fortifications here were either reconstructed or repurposed during the Civil War. And uh, they were built right on top of the original British fortifications. And this Hornwork would have been garrisoned by Colonel Abercrombie's Light Infantry. And just behind us would be Cornwallis's uh, headquarters. And for reference, if you're ever visiting Yorktown, this is where we are. Your visitor center is just right here and we are at the Hornwork. And you can also see some of the other British units here that would have been garrisoned here. You have the 80th Regiment, the 43rd, and this looks like the first, I can't really read that, but beside them is the uh, 7th Regiment here. And you can kind of see on the British right or the American and French left, you have a few more fortifications there. And readouts number nine and 10 were here. So as you can see, once those readouts were captured by the American and French, they were able to extend that second siege line to the York River. So here is your horn work and the British defenses spanned along the outskirts of Yorktown here. And they continue this way. And just on the other side of this field, right here, that's where Cornwallis would have his headquarters. Now obviously, that building would be destroyed by artillery fire, but yeah, so just over there, Cornwallis had his headquarters right next to the British outer defenses here. So we've moved our way down the British lines a little bit now, and I wanted to show you the perspectives here. So just across the field, you can see right here, that is the second siege line. And across this field, right here, is readout number nine, and readout number 10 would be in this general area, okay? So, and here is more British defenses running towards the York River, and the British, <laughs> the British, and the Yorktown Visitor Center is right there. So, once these readouts were captured, Cornwallis knew his days were numbered. But in one last desperate attempt, he would aim all his remaining artillery pieces at one section of the Allied Second Siege Line, trying to take out as many of these cannons as possible. Well, on top of that, he would have 350 British soldiers leave the defenses here under cover of darkness. They would march across this field silently. They would breach the Second Siege Line right here in this general area, and they would begin, and their mission was to destroy as many Allied cannons as possible because this is what was wreaking havoc on the British lines. Well, there was one problem. In order to spike the guns, which means that they would drive a nail into the small chamber that would ignite the powder. Well, if you spike your gun, you're no longer able to light that cannon 
and it's going to take extensive repairs and be out of commission for quite a while. But there is one problem. The British attack force forgot their nails, so they couldn't spike the cannons. So once they breached the Allied lines, they began trying to break off some of their bayonets into the cannons using dirt, using really anything they could to shove into those ignition holes. Well, obviously the American and French forces became alerted to this and they drove the British back. And what cannons were out of action weren't out of action very long. And that was just showing how desperate Cornwallis was becoming. And just panning back over, and you can see the horn work up here where we started. So this was the British lines and their perspective, and you can see the Allied lines in the distance there. So that was a very surface level view of the Battle of Yorktown. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the battle, the American Battlefield Trust, the Smithsonian, those are probably one of the best resources out there online or and they also have map books and things of that nature. So if you want to learn a little more, I'll attach those websites down below in the description. And uh, like always, we'll catch you on the next one. What do you need, dude? Hey, read out number nine and ten or that way. Yeah.